photons. These particles of light slowly work their way to the surface where you see the sunlight. Helium is the ash of the sun's nuclear furnace. The sun is a medium-sized star. Its core is only a lukewarm 10 million degrees. Hot enough to fuse hydrogen, but too cold to fuse helium. There are many stars in the galaxy that get much hotter because they're more massive and have more gravity. Such stars fuse helium into heavier elements like carbon and oxygen. In their old age, they gently diffuse these elements into space. Other stars, more massive yet, live fast and die young. Cataclysmic supernova explosions. In our galaxy, such stars go supernova about once a century. Those explosions are far hotter than the core of the sun. Hot enough to transform elements like iron into all the heavier ones and spew them into space. The Large Magellanic Cloud is a neighboring galaxy of our Milky Way. It's visible in the skies in the southern hemisphere. When a supernova explodes, its brightness rivals that of its entire galaxy. of the energy liberated by the explosion. The rest of the energy is carried off by the most common and the most mysterious particle in the cosmos. The trillions of them passing through you right now. And yet, tracking down even one of them will take us to one of the strangest places on Earth. was the rarest of sport. The lengths one must go to track them down is nothing short of astonishing. Welcome to Super Kamioka, a subterranean Japanese neutrino detection chamber. We're more than a half mile beneath our surface. You might ask, well, who in their right mind would bury an astronomical observatory so far underground? Those who hunt the most elusive prey in the cosmos, the neutrino. This enormous array of light detectors surrounding 50,000 tons of distilled water is a trap designed to catch neutrinos only. Other particles, such as cosmic rays, mostly protons and electrons that rain down from space, cannot get through all that rock above us. But matter poses no obstacle to a neutrino. A neutrino can pass through 100 light years of steel without even slowing down. Neutrinos hardly interact with matter at all. That's why you need so much of it to catch even one of them. On those rare occasions when a neutrino actually does collide with a particle of ordinary matter, it produces a ghostly, man shaped flash of light. The lying in wait for a particle that weighs next to nothing. Even the minuscule electron has more than a million times its mass. There. When the supernova in the Large Magellanic Cloud blew its top in 1987, this is what it would have looked like in here. Now remember, the Large Magellanic Cloud is in our southern hemisphere, so the neutrinos didn't come through that half mile of rock above us. They had to pass through the thousands of miles of rock and iron below us to reach this detector. But the coolest thing was that those neutrinos hit Earth three hours before the light from the supernova did. If nothing can travel faster than light, how could that possibly be? This is a dead star walking. It may look normal, but deep within it, something cataclysmic is happening. This blue supergiant star has already begun to explode inside. Like rats deserting a sinking ship, the neutrinos produced in the heart of the exploding star raced outward at near the speed of light through the overlying mass in only a few seconds. But the shockwave of the exploding gas plods along from the center of the star at one ten thousandth the speed of light until it finally reaches the star's surface, turning it into supernova 1987A. It took hours to 
hours from the explosion to reach the surface of the star and blow it wide open, exposing the super hot core. The neutrinos had an insurmountable head start. That's why the flash of light arrived on Earth so much later than the shower of neutrinos. Before anyone had ever snared the wild neutrino, it existed in the mind of a theoretical physicist. Just as Charles Darwin knew it must be an extremely long-nosed creature flying around somewhere in Madagascar, a 20th century physicist named Wolfgang Pauli was desperately seeking a particle to rescue one of the pillars of modern physics, the law of conservation of energy. So why didn't I flinch? Because the laws of science differ fundamentally from those of other human endeavors. In order for an idea to become scientific law, it has to be unbreakable. That's why I was willing to bet this face on the laws of conservation of energy. Now, if you try this at home, take care not to give the cannonball a push. That's adding energy, and the ball will surely come back and do some damage. You just have to let it go, like this. By lifting the ball, you give it gravitational energy, which is the potential to fall or accelerate. The cannonball is going fastest when it's at the bottom of its arc. At that moment, it's converted all of its gravitational energy to the energy of motion. As it swings, the cannonball is constantly exchanging one of these two kinds of energy for the other, but the total amount of energy remains constant. That's an example of the law of conservation of energy. Once the cannonball is released, it can never gain more energy than it had to begin with. It has no way to fly up and break my nose. The energy accounting books are always strictly balanced. No such thing as cheating. So in the 20th century, when physicists first calculated the energy of atoms precisely, they were startled to discover an apparent violation of this law. They found that in some radioactive atoms, the nucleus can spontaneously eject an electron. This transforms the atom into a different element. The physicists were mystified. The energy of the escaped electron plus that of the new atom adds up to less than the energy in the original nucleus. But the law says, thou shalt not destroy or create energy. So where did the missing energy go? In 1930, Wolfgang Paul predicted there must be an undiscovered particle, one that makes off with the missing energy. At the time, Pauli lamented that such a phantom particle might be so minute, swift, and evasive as to forever defy detection. But that was a rare failure of his imagination, because science is always searching for a way to go deeper still. A generation later, Pauli's neutrinos were actually detected for the first time in radiation from a nuclear reactor. And we've been finding them with difficulty ever since. There are scientists today who are trying to find a way to ride those neutrinos all the way back beginning of time. We'll go as far as they have gone to come up against the wall of forever. The wall of forever is nothing new. Our ancestors came up against it almost as soon as they first started imagining it. A million dawns ago, in the 13th century BC, the Egyptians built this temple at Abu Simbel to honor the Pharaoh Ramses II, depicted here in four colossal statues. Reigning even above this mighty king is the falcon-headed Ra Haraki, god of the sun. The temple was designed so that the light from the rising sun could only enter the sanctuary on two days every year. As the rays enter the temple, they burnish the statues of the gods with their golden light before penetrating the sanctuary. Even then, one god remains in shadow. Ta, lord of creation, as if the origin of the universe must forever be concealed. Feels. 
sun on your face. The energy that warmed you began its journey some 10 million years ago in the heart of the sun. Unlike neutrinos, the photons needed that long to work their way out from the core to the surface. Why? Because they were colliding millions of times per second with the sun's atoms, every collision sending them off in a random direction. Once they finally reached the surface, they were free to dash non-stop at the speed of light in a mere 8 minutes and 20 seconds from the sun to you. 10 million year old light on your face. What was happening when that light left in the heart of the sun? The cosmic calendar compresses the entire 13.8 billion year history of the universe into a single year. Every month represents about a billion years. Every day, about 40 billion years. The universe is so old that on the cosmic calendar, 10 million years ago, only takes us back as far as 6 p.m. on the last evening, the last day of the year. And what about us? Humans had yet to evolve. 10 million years ago, our ancestors were anthropoid apes swinging through the trees of Africa. To us, 10 million years seems like a long time, but it's only the length of an afternoon on the time scale of the cosmos. The sun began fusing hydrogen 4,500 million years ago, August 31st on the cosmic calendar. Our Milky Way galaxy is about 10 thousand million years old. The first galaxies formed a few billion years earlier. And something keeps me from going any further back in time. What is this? It's the nature of light and time. Because light travels at a finite speed, to look across space is to look back in time. So the farther we see, the older the light. This is as far back in the history of the cosmos as we can see. With light, it's a baby picture of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old. That's 15 minutes into January 1st on the cosmic calendar. If we look as far as we can see in any direction using microwave telescopes, this is what we see. The globe left over from the Big Bang. Imagine that all the matter and energy of the observable universe was concentrated into something no larger than this. That's the size of the universe when it was a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. All the matter and energy of the hundred billion galaxies now splayed out across the billions of light years were once pent up in something the size of a marble. Can you imagine how tightly packed that marble must have been? Far too dense for any kind of light to move through it. But no obstacle for the likes of neutrinos. The Big Bang must have produced stupendous numbers of neutrinos, which flew unhindered through that inconceivable crush of matter. The very thing that makes them almost impossible to detect is what allows neutrinos to sail through the curtain that conceals the beginning of time. Where are they now? They're here, they're there, everywhere throughout the universe. Neutrinos from creation are within you. From the marble to the cosmos. This is the road that Thales and Democritus put us on some 2,500 years ago. A road of endless searching, a relentless, systematic hunt for new worlds, and an ever-deepening understanding of nature. Who among you will pick up that torch and take us down that next stretch of road?